All right, without further ado, let's get to tonight's speaker, Martin Erickson. I'm super excited to have him uh, speak here. He's in town from London. Yeah, he stayed a little longer to be with us today and share his wisdom. Um, who's heard of Mind the Product before? Everybody. Who's on the email list, newsletter? If you're not on the email newsletter, you should get on it. It's one of the best, if not the best, product email newsletters out there with a lot of great art articles and content. Um, he also founded Product Tank. He's had a, got a lot of product experience at companies like Monster and Financial Times. He's a co-author of the product leadership book uh, that we're going to give away from O'Reilly. And uh, his Twitter handle is BFG Martin. That's also written on the walls. And he's going to talk to us today about how better cross-functional teams um, build better products and share his advice. So, Martin, welcome. Hopefully the microphone's working. There we go. Right. Thanks for having me, everyone. Uh, uh, I'm excited to be here. It's always good to hang out with other product nerds and, and talk about all the stuff that we get excited about. So uh, as Dan said, I'm going to talk a little bit about how building better teams leads to better products. But before I do that, I kind of wanted to step back a little bit and look at the bigger picture. So software is eating the world. We've all heard that. Mark Andreessen said that way back in 2011. It's worth taking a moment to think about how much has actually happened since then. Back then, Uber was a simple black car service in San Francisco, and today it's worth an insane $50 billion. It's the world's largest taxi company, and yet it owns no cars, except for a handful of self-driving ones. Airbnb had just gotten started, and today that's worth $42 billion. It's the world's largest accommodation provider, and yet it owns no real estate. Alibaba was already up and running, but it's since grown to a $480 billion company. It's the world's largest retailer, and yet it owns no inventory. You can see where this is going. Something has changed. And it's not just at that kind of startup scale. Back then, the S&P 500 included ExxonMobil, Chevron, and Walmart. And today, it's completely dominated by technology firms. And you'll also see that Although IBM was in the list, it's kind of dropped out because of, they don't have this focus on software. So I think it's fair to say that software is eating the world, but it's not done yet. In fact, Mark Andreessen's even updated his own line to say that software is programming the world. And I'd also argue that the transformation is speeding up with disruptive new companies, new technologies, and products springing up every single day. So not only is it eating the world, it's moving faster and faster and faster. And the rate of change that you experience today is the slowest it will ever be. So as Dan said, my name is Martin Erickson. I'm also known as the big friendly giant of product for reasons which should be obvious now that I'm standing in front of you guys. I started building products online when the internet still came on floppies. And in fact, I can claim to have beaten Snapchat, Facebook, and Periscope to the punch by over 20 years by hosting the first online live stream in Europe. Of course, it did take five engineers and a giant satellite truck from the local telco to even make the thing run. The video resolution was so terrible, I don't even have a screenshot to share with you. And because it was a student orchestra festival, I'm not sure the sound was much better, but it worked. Since then, I've worked all over the world for startups and corporates. I co-founded Product Tank, which is the world's largest product management community. We now have meetups in 140 cities around the world, including San Francisco and here in the Valley. And the last two years I've spent with these jokers, uh, interviewing hundreds of product leaders from all over the world to figure out how we keep up with this pace of change, how we build better products. And I do these things because I'm fascinated by how we can actually build products people love and how we keep up with this brutal piece of pace of change. So first, I think it's important to understand what it really means when Mark said that software is eating the world. And it means our interface to the world around us is changing. And I'm not talking about UI. Mark Andreessen himself said that all of the technology required to transform industries through software finally works and can be deployed at global scale. Now, this is a fundamental shift in how we interact with technology, 
with new interaction models popping up every day, trying to tear us away from our desktops. First mobile, then wearables, and then all at once it feels like augmented reality, virtual reality, voice, bots, and AI seem to be changing how we interact with technology. And as builders, this means that it's moving faster and faster and that we need more and more specialized skills to actually build these products. It also means how we interact with each other is changing. Every day, it seems a new paradigm for social interaction pops up, from the heady old days of email to chat tools, Snapchat, and video apps. Who here would have predicted how quickly Slack would have taken over how we all work in our offices? But perhaps most significantly, we're also seeing the emergence of several new business models. Remember just how revolutionary software as a service was just 10 years ago. I launched the first recruitment software as a service in Europe, and we didn't even call it that. It was called application service providers. In the last few years, we've seen the dominance of the App Store model, experimentation subscription services, pricing models, DLC and games, and so much more. I got here today by renting an Audi from Audi for the day. In London, you can actually subscribe to Volvos. You pay a monthly fee, it includes the tax, insurance, running costs, everything, and then you can swap it every six months, just like your mobile phone. Business models are improving just as quickly as the software underneath. And what that means is that these new insane advances in technology, business, and design are building that new interface to the world. And that's ultimately why we're all here today, because we're building that interface. But it's also why it's so damn hard, because these new innovations intersect design, technology, and business. Now, some of you might recognize that Venn diagram. I wrote it in 2011 as a definition of product management, but it's also true for how we can actually work together, because no one discipline can solve all the challenges that all three face. So I kind of want you to ignore the semantics of job titles. I don't care if you're a product manager, I don't care if you're a product owner, I don't care if you're a data scientist, a designer, an engineer, a researcher, or a content producer. At the end of the day, and I also want you to ignore the endless debates about who owns the product, who owns the user, who owns the code. I don't care anymore. Because at the end of the day, we all own the product together. And actually, we're probably all product managers. Because this requires a new way of working, and none of us can do this alone. And like any good heist movie, it starts with assembling your team. So again, that Venn diagram, uh, I think the challenge with this is a lot of people presume that this means that everyone on the team has to look like this. When, as you all know, we look like this, like this, or like this. And it's only when we actually come together as a team that we have all those skills uh, and we can successfully build products people love. And in fact, there's probably a dozen more circles overlapping those three. So it's worth really digging into what are the skills that you need in your team to make that succeed. It's not just about those three, and this is definitely not a definitive list, but just some things to think about, whether it's work experience, industry knowledge, creativity, culture, life experience. And then as you start mapping these bits out, you can make sure that you're bringing in different contexts, different experiences, and insights to your team. And you can see where you have overlaps and where you have gaps and start thinking about what other skill sets that you need. Diversity is so important because decades of research by organizational scientists, psychologists, sociologists, economists, demographers, etc., show us that socially diverse groups are more innovative than homogenous groups. Simply put, a group of people with diverse individual experiences are better than a homogenous group at solving complex problems. Diversity is also incredibly important in product because at the end of the day, it's all about having empathy with the end user. And so it's not just important to have that diverse group because it brings new information, but simply interacting with individuals who are different forces group members to prepare better, anticipate alternative viewpoints, and experience reaching a consensus, and experience empathy 
within their own team, which means that they're more likely to be able to apply outside their team with their customers. And if those things don't appeal to you, I can appeal to your bottom line. Diverse companies also perform better. In a giant McKinsey study of over 1,000 companies over 15 years, they proved that the top quartile of diverse companies are a whopping 35% more likely to outperform their competitors. At the end of the day, product is a team sport. So while we bring all these skills together, it's important to put them in one cross-functional team. It's critical because only by bringing together the understanding of the problem space that we get through research, design, and empathy, with an understanding of the solution space that we get from the engineers and the designers, can we find the opportunities for great products. But it's also critical because, as we all know, once you have more than one team in a company, you introduce friction. There are libraries and libraries of project management methodologies, inbox tools, to-do tools. All of this stuff is simply there to manage communication from one team to another team. And friction kills momentum. Friction kills speed. So really think about what you can bring into that team, and not just developers, designers, and product managers, but all the skills that team needs to be able to execute. My favorite example of this is a startup in London called TransferWise. They're an online currency transfer platform, and a great example is a team called the Currencies Team. This is the team responsible for launching new currency paths, like dollars to pounds. And as you can imagine, it's a little bit more complicated than just adding that selection to a drop-down. They have to open bank accounts in the target country. They have to create new um, terms and conditions, new contracts. And in any other organization, this would require them to go to the banking team and ask for permission and help opening a bank account. Then once that's done, they'd go to the legal department and ask for help rewriting the terms and conditions. But TransferWise have really embraced this cross-functional spirit. And they actually have a lawyer and a banker full-time embedded in this team, which means that they have everything they need to execute their goals. They have no dependencies on anyone else. <coughs> Contrast that with recently, I met an amazing data scientist that worked at a Fortune 50 company who proudly pronounced that they worked for the Research and Insight Division. Just think about that for a moment. A division responsible for research and insight. On the one hand, it kind of sounds fantastic, right? We have a whole division, all these amazing people doing tons of research. Think of all the resources we have to do ethnographic studies, surveys, data collection. On the other hand, think about the nightmare caused by trying to interact with that in a different division. Imagine the request forms. Imagine the prioritization and approval processes that are needed to gatekeep that resource. Imagine having to write a business case to get the resources needed for your business case. So once we've put our team together and we make sure that we have all the skills needed in one beautiful cross-functional team, it's important to let them create their own destiny. And it's important to empower them with autonomy. We don't work in cotton mills or factories anymore, so why are we using the management styles that came out of them? Command and control made a ton of sense when only a handful of top managers had the knowledge and the experience, and labor was literally a human resource that needed to be corralled. Most of the agile and lean methodologies we use today come from the Toyota production system, and they're fantastic if you've designed a Prius and you want to build it as cheaply, efficiently, and error-free as possible. But we kind of forget that the team that designed the Prius just doesn't work that way. They can't work that way. At the end of the day, your team is smarter than you, your team is more informed than you, your team is closer to the customer than you, and they're closer to the problem than you. So why are you telling them what to do? Instead, we have to empower our teams, and we have to embrace autonomy. We need to let them use all of that amazing knowledge, all of those skills, all of those resources they have to just get on with the job of solving the customer problem. 
Autonomy is fantastic because it motivates teams better. How many of you read Dan Pink's book, Drive? If you haven't read it, there's also a fantastic Cliff Notes version in his TED Talk, so just go watch that for 20 minutes. In it, he basically goes through a ton of research that they did in MIT, looking at how to motivate knowledge workers like us. And what they found was that once you hit a certain level of salary, market rate, and you get and have a nice little bonus, adding on financial incentives did not lead to better performance, did not lead to better outcomes, did not lead to more innovative ideas. It flatlined. Instead, the three things they found, you've probably heard these before, were autonomy, mastery, and purpose. Autonomy is our desire to be self-directed. Mastery is hopefully while you're all here, it's our desire to be a master at our craft. And purpose is that bigger picture vision. So the more you can find those three things and motivate your team around them, the more likely you are to succeed. But autonomy is also better at scaling. Instead of figuring out how to get 20, 30, 40, 50 engineers to talk to each other, you carve out new teams. And you give them an area of focus that they can own, that that small team can execute on with all the resources they need, so they don't need those dependencies, they don't need those challenges of communication. It's also fast, something we all want to be, right? Because you remove all those layers of um, decision-making between the customer and the team, means that they can respond much faster to customer feedback, to customer problems, to new market demand, new trends, et cetera. Now, a lot of people hear autonomy and they think anarchy. They think it means everyone can do whatever they want, build whatever they want, and come and go as they please. But the key here is to build autonomy with accountability. It only works when teams don't just feel ownership of the process and what they build, but they feel ownership over the customer outcome. So leadership still has a huge role to play in setting that vision, the mission, and the goals that that team is tasked with executing, and making sure that they're all aligned with each other. Henrik Nieberg, who's the organizational coach and agile coach at Spotify, had this great two-by-two -two chart to kind of illustrate this process, measuring alignment versus autonomy. And if you start in the bottom left corner, where you have low autonomy and low alignment, it's where you have your micromanaging organization and an indifferent culture. If you move up the alignment scale, you get an authoritative organization and a conformist culture. The manager is there to tell you what to do and exactly how to do it. If you instead move up the autonomy scale, you have your classic startup, an entrepreneurial organization, chaotic culture. You kind of hope someone's working on the actual problem. And like any good two-by-two two chart, consultants out there know this, you need to be in the top right corner, high alignment and high autonomy, which is how you build an innovative organization and a collaborative culture. And the leader is still there, it still has a huge job to do in making sure that the team knows what the goal is, but then lets the team figure out how to get there. True autonomy also means removing any dependencies on shared resources or central teams. Any team should be able to change any part of the product if it furthers their goals. So for example, marketing shouldn't have to wait for product to build what they need. They should have full access to build pages, change user flows, or do anything else necessary in pursuit of their goals. A true growth marketing team can't stop at the landing page. They need to be able to follow their cohort, cohorts all the way through conversion and retention to make sure that those channels and that marketing is truly successful. True autonomy also means that everybody gets involved and brings all of those amazing skills to bear on all the challenges the team faces. Because only by co-creating can we bring all those skills and perspectives to bear on the customer problem. As Marty Kagan himself said, who was here last week, or last session, if you're only using your engineers to code, you're only getting half of their value. And I would argue the same, that's true for all of us, right? If you're only using your designers to push pixels, you're probably only getting half of their value. If you're only using product managers to groom backlogs, you're probably only getting half their value. 
So get the engineers involved in design, get your designers involved in engineering discussions, and get everybody involved in customer research. Because insight and great product ideas come from the least expected corners. I remember it was probably still one of my proudest product moments, just working with this team at a software as a service company in London. We were building collaboration software, and we were experimenting with this new way of working. We'd already set up small semi-autonomous teams with a product manager, a designer, and engineers. And although we were a small startup and only had two of those teams, we rotated them through business as usual work and big new feature ideas. And one day, we were kicking off one of those big new feature ideas, which involved totally rewriting and redesigning a core part of the feature set. And for the first time, we gathered everyone involved for those first two days of our kind of sprint zero where we were clarifying exactly what we were going to do and exactly what we were going to build. And when I say everyone, I mean everyone. We didn't just bring that team. We brought the marketing team, we brought the customer success team, we brought the support team, sales team. And once we'd briefed everyone on the goals of the product, it kind of happened. The team came up with all the ideas that we needed to solve the customer problem. I didn't write a single story. I didn't design a single wireframe. And the thing that excited me the most was that one of the junior developers came up with what became the cornerstone feature that solved 80% of the problem for like 20% of the effort. And it's something that I could never have come up with myself. But he could do it because he understood the problem space, he understood the code base, and because we'd briefed the team on what the goals were, he knew how to apply that. Of course, it's not all roses. Sometimes the teams look like that. But that conflict and that debate is better internally than pushed out to your customer. So once we've set up our team, we've given them autonomy. I'm also a huge believer in co-located teams. I know this is kind of a debate. There's a lot of passion for remote teams. But I think it's incredibly important to have that high bandwidth communication that you can only get by sitting together in a room. Even the world's probably most famous product designer, Johnny Ive, knows this. There's kind of a fallacy in our industry that Apple designs everything in an ivory tower, that it's just Steve Jobs and then Johnny Ive that designed everything themselves with no input from anyone. But of course, it's not actually true. And Apple's new headquarters just down the road are a stunning piece of design. But what really excites me about it is that like all good design, it is the physical embodiment of these principles. A huge reason for the design of that insane looking new space is to encourage more interaction between different skills and to allow teams of varied skill sets to sit next to each other and work together however they want. Johnny and I have recently said that one of the things that he's absurdly excited about with this new space is that at the moment they have a number of really physically connected design studios and now they can share the same space. They can have industrial designers sat next to a font designer, sat next to a sound designer, who sat next to a motion graphics expert, who sat next to a color designer, who sat next to somebody with developing objects and soft materials. I've worked remotely and I've worked co-located in different cultures in different cult countries, and I can tell you that there's simply no replacement for that level of communication that you get by sitting together. Doesn't mean you have to sit together every day. You can still work more remotely and go home and have that focus time if that's what works best for you and your team. But the more you can spend time together, the more you can get around a whiteboard, the more you can get around the physical space, the more likely you are to be able to get that alignment. And that's why it's so important that as product managers, founders, and leaders, that we design the spaces in which we work. It doesn't mean you have to spend a fortune like Apple did, although, of course, they can afford it. It does mean being conscious about how we design our working environment, because it impacts our working style. <laughs> how many of you here watch The Profit on CNBC? Three hands, four hands. It's a bit of a guilty pleasure of mine. Um, it's basically this guy, Mark Slimonis. He's a successful businessman. He goes into small kind of mom and pop businesses around the US, uh, not just investing money, but also kind of helping them transform their processes, their products, their cultures, their teams. And the first thing he does in almost every situation 
is rearrange the physical space to optimize the workflow, whether it's a factory floor, a frozen yogurt shop. And I think the reason I bring this up is why do we think building digital products is different? Why do we think about factory flow and flow in spaces and event spaces, but we don't think about how that flow works in our offices? Zing is a company in Germany, it's basically the kind of the LinkedIn for the German language, and they have this fantastic concept called Auftragsklärung. Don't worry, no one's going to ask you to spell it or pronounce it. It's basically a template for how they pitch, discuss, and monitor their product ideas. Each team prepares one of these giant posters as their way to get resources, provide alignment, and then they update it as they go, as they learn new things. As they update that information, they challenge their assumptions. But the beauty is it's a physical canvas. So not only do they have it in their space, they can bring it with them to that meeting room when all the teams are talking about what they're working on and walk each other through it. And then they hang it back up in their own space so anybody walking past can see what that team is working on and ask questions or add information that they might have. And the format of the canvas doesn't matter. It could be the lean canvas, business model canvas, it could be something you design yourself. What matters to me is the interaction that this physical object encourages and allows and how it makes the team alignment almost effortless. And you don't have to travel that far to see this in practice either. The companies from Spotify to Drift to Intercom to Pluralsight pictured here, Box in San Francisco, they all work like this. And just walking through any of these spaces shows you cross-functional teams co-creating every day. You'll see walls and tables covered in post-its where teams are aligning on what they see as a customer problem and how they want to solve it. And you see video calls where all those teams talk to the customer to figure out how to solve it. So success is a function of a team's ability to uncover a customer problem, envision a solution that empowers that customer, and then delivers that solution in a delightful and efficient way. Our job is to get the hell out of the way. The bottom line is that the process is also your product, especially if you're a product leader. And the culture is your product, just as much, if not more, than what you actually ship every day. Because that culture and that process is what lets you ship the right product for the customer and to do it faster and better than your competition. So as product managers, founders, leaders, it's our job to design and work on this culture and the process from the people we hire to the structure and spaces that we put them in. And as members of those teams, it's incumbent on all of us to remember that we all own the product because we're all product managers. So embrace this autonomy to build not just the most amazing products you've ever built, but the most amazing teams too. Thank you. So it went a little short, but I think it means we have more time for questions. Yeah. So the way we do questions is we have people running mics, so raise your hand, and one of the mic uh, runners will give you the microphone, and then uh, if you don't have a mic in your hand, don't ask a question. That's how it works, so we can get it on the video. All right. I'll take this one. Who's got a question for Martin? All right. Hey, uh, thanks for the talk. You mentioned physical space, and then you gave the example of a separate division for research. How much do you think the organizational structure can either support or prevent successful teams from coming together, assuming they have the physical space and virtual teams are possible? I think it, I mean, I'm, I think the talk is all about the organizational structure, right? I think it, it is incumbent on product leaders and founders, CEOs, to give that space so that teams have, you know, that they're not in a separate division. I was kind of using it as a horror example more than anything else, right? I think it's, um, it's basically almost guaranteed to make you fail in the long run if you have those kind of divisions of like a you know, design team versus the product team versus the engineering team. Because inevitably they end up having different goals and different measures and different KPIs and you're just not going to get that alignment. You're not going to get that speed that you want out of those teams either. So 
Um, I think basically what I'm really passionate about is trying to build those cross-functional small teams that have the autonomy to execute and that have, again, all those skills in that team. And then that does need buy-in or help from the top to actually make happen, right? And, and then the knowledge sharing or uh, growth within the function happens on dotted lines teams? Like yeah, a little bit. I mean, so an example at Spotify is they have the, they call these team squads, uh, and then the squads are part of larger tribes, so like the whole B2C function might be a tribe, um, but then they also have guilds. The names are a bit silly, but it kind of works. Uh, they have guilds, so every UX designer belongs to the UX guild that then can meet once a week or a month or whatever to make sure that they are, have the design best practice, things like that. But again, I think it's more important that the team that's focused on a customer problem works together and sits together than the, all the designers sit together because then the designer isn't talking to the engineer, the engineer isn't talking to the product manager. Um, and you can figure out ways to do that anyway, whether you call it guilds and have meetings or you just make sure that uh, they have a monthly catch-up and the, whoever's your head of design, make sure that they go sit with their design managers every time. There's different ways to do that, but again, it's more about changing that perception so that you have um, one team focused on a customer problem as opposed to a design team and an engineering team that are focused on their own goals as opposed to a customer. Cool, thank you. What is the what is the optim optimal size for this cross-functional team? If you have a larger project, if you split up into multiple cross-functional teams, again, you run into the communication problem. I think it, uh, as we've seen with Agile and other things, you can break down those projects into smaller chunks. Uh, I, my personal view is the optimum team size for this is the kind of the two pizza team, right? It's kind of the, the standard thing, so it's about 10, 12 people max. Uh, that said, it does depend on what the team is doing, right? If it is a very heavy lifting back-end project, maybe you need to double that to have more back-end engineering for a specific focus and then break that up again. But I, I do think that you can break down the customer problems and you can break down the tech stack enough that a small team can kind of get done what they need to get done. I also think it does depend a little bit on the stage of company. So if you're building something from scratch from new, then maybe everyone has to work together to get that done. And then this is a, a very good way to kind of do the ongoing development and innovation um, of that product. Any other questions? Down the front here. Uh, hi. Hello. Uh, I run a small product team. Um, I work for Marketo. Um, and this team is pretty autonomous within the company because it's through an acquisition we made fully stacked, very independent group of engineers, product managers. Um, we have one designer, which we need more designers. Um, and we're very, I wish to say, we want to be very innovative and outward thinking, but we're very much constrained by business objectives, revenue numbers, and dates. So we have like dates we have to hit, like there's no, like, non-negotiable dates. So it's kind of like limiting the creativity and morale of the team. And I'm just curious, like, if you have any advice or if you've been through that scenario, because, I mean, coming, it's a big company, so it's hard to make some changes upstream. But we're trying to, like, do hackathons and things to keep the engineers really motivated and the PMs, yeah. but we kind of hit walls. I was just curious if you had any advice. I think it's, I mean, it's great that you have the team with that autonomy, but it's only really comes into its own when they're then all focused on a goal, right? A customer goal, a customer problem, a customer segment, what, whatever it is. So even though you have that kind of business as usual pressure, you, you basically you have to find a way to carve out time to, you know, if you do, so for example, that startup I worked at where we had just two small teams, right? We would rotate them through. So like at any one point, one team was always working on basically bugs, BAU, small fixes, like the time release stuff that has to happen. And the other team got to kind of carve out a month to like, here's a customer problem we want to solve. What's the best thing that we can do to solve that problem? Here's all the research, here's all the data. Whether you call it Sprint Zero, you do a design sprint, like whatever the methodology you use to kind of do that. But it is carving out that time so that they can actually step away from that day to day of like, how do we actually improve the product? How do we find that 10x thing? How do we find that next big innovative feature as opposed to just kind of grinding through small feature improvements? So if you only have one team, maybe you just have to find a way to time box it. So like, January, we're going to do BAU. February, we're going to like lock ourselves away and come up with some new cool stuff. And I think the more you can try find 
evidence that that helps, the more you'll be able to convince your leaders that that kind of um, makes sense, right? So if, if you can find a small project, just do a week or something, then show, hey, look at this great new thing that we shipped and how happy customers are with that. Can we have more of that time, basically? Hope that helped a little bit, at least. It's not easy, yeah. but... Yeah, so kind of a, I think a s similar but opposite question. Um, I'm at a small startup, like 30 people, CEO is very involved. How do you go about pushing for more autonomy uh, for either a product team or a dev team? I think it's like all good change management. It's about building trust. So again, find the smallest thing that you can do that shows that the team has a good idea, that could ship that idea, could impact a metric, could impact a lever, whatever it was. And even if it's like, you carved out a day and you built a cool little thing or you redid the footer on the homepage or whatever it is and you impacted a metric. The more you can do those little things, the more you're going to build trust with that CEO. And like I've been in that situation where I've been the first product person to take over from a founder and like it's a bit like trying to steal their baby. So it's the same thing, right? You wouldn't just go to someone, your your, nep your brother's house and like steal his nephew for a weekend. Like you can get to hold him first and then you get to like come and babysit for a couple of hours and then maybe you get the whole weekend. So. The more you can build up that trust, basically, is how you're going to do it. So find the small thing where there's a couple hours a day where you go, I, we have a hypothesis. This is uh, a problem we can solve. Here's how we're going to solve it. Prove that you kind of impacted the metric the way that you thought you would impact that metric. You're going to earn that trust to do bigger and bigger and bigger things. Martin, one of the questions uh, that I had was around autonomy, right? Like. So as a product manager, I always tend to give uh, a lot of autonomy to my entire team. And one of the challenges that I often face is like this autonomy turns into too much uh, interference because uh, every single person wants to come up with uh, an idea or, uh, and then they lose track of what customer problem that, they, that we are trying to solve. So for example, like, you know, we have a lot of these uh, business solution analysts and they start thinking about like very edge case scenarios. While it's good to think about those uh, scenarios and keeping a customer empathy in mind, uh, but for me, when I'm trying to solve the larger problem, right, those those are very bottom in my priority list. How do I? So, so this is this is one of the key challenges that I'm having to get everyone on the same page, saying that. Yes, I agree that customer empathy is important, but let's focus on solving the problem for a larger set of customers rather than focusing on the customer, which you might not even uh, end up having a problem. Yeah, I think it's it comes back to that alignment piece, right? So it's kind of however you do it again within your team, but delineating like the ideation time from like execution time, right? Obviously, you're not sitting. The whole idea of this isn't to sit around every day like, oh, what are, like, what do we want to work on? And like, we're going to go do this and everyone wants to do different things. But it's kind of having that kickoff process where you bring in and you have a very clear, like, this is the, you know, the overall company strategy. This is the vision of it. This is what we're, like, our goal, what we're trying to achieve. Um, and then this is a specific customer problem we're trying to solve. And then you spend a few days doing that ideation, like, what is, what is the best thing? Prioritizing that. Use the data that you have. And then it kind of switches back into execution mode, right? And then then it's still Scrum or Kanban or whatever process you want to do to actually ship that so that you can measure it and iterate on it. So I think part of it is the alignment piece, making sure that everyone still remembers like what that overarching goal is, um, why that's important to focus on, why it's important to customers, so that you can keep coming back to that point of like, yes, that's a great idea, but remember, this is the goal, right? This is the big, the big thing that we're going for. And they go, oh, yeah, that's right, okay, let's get back to work kind of thing, right? Um, and then also kind of delineating, I think, the ideation from the actual execution. Because at some point, you still have to execute, you still have to ship, you still have to test whether your hypothesis made sense. Um, does that help? This is applicable uh, not only in terms of a larger project, but also once the project has gone uh, live, or a particular product has gone live, and you're continuously churning on new features or yep. enhancements. So. Yep. Is this applicable even in that I scenario? think so, yeah. I mean, I think this is especially applicable when you're in that mode of like continually trying to figure out how you can improve things. And again, it becomes, so the way I think about it is kind of, um, my, you know, your roadmaps about themes, as like a lot of people talk about now. Um, and so like the theme is, you know, we're gonna, we have a conversion problem and we wanna improve our conversion rate. Like how can we do that? And then you like the whole team gets behind that, 
figures out what are the ideas that they have, what are the hypotheses, how can they validate those hypotheses. You know, the whole lean product cycle comes into that. And then ship and iterate, ship and iterate, ship and iterate as you learn, right? So it's, it's, it's just getting that focus on a goal so that the whole team's aligned on a goal and kind of is aiming in the same direction. And the autonomy is more about doing this than like, oh, we're gonna go over here now, right? It's, it's still focusing on that core goal of whatever metric it is you're trying to improve, whatever customer problem it is that you're trying to solve. Just last one last question. What would you say the role of a product manager in this scenario be? Like, is, is the product manager more like uh, of the guiding force, just making sure everyone comes together on that one single uh, goal? I think, basically, yeah, I mean, I think there, it's two parts, right? One is the, the alignment around the goal, and then it's kind of being the coach throughout that process of like, to your point, f helping them understand that, yes, that's a great idea, but remember, this is the big goal. Like, how can we make sure that we're achieving that? Making sure that the teams are talking to each other, their teams talking to each other. Um, it's also really important for us then to be the communication layer between teams, right? So if you have a bunch of autonomous teams all kind of firing on all cylinders, you want to make sure that they're not going to crash into each other. Inevitably, uh, you know, you have teams, if you go the, the whole way, like I talked about allowing any team to touch any part of the product, every team's gonna wanna touch the dashboard, right? So that becomes the product manager's job to figure out the priorities there and who's gonna have the most impact by actually making that change, stuff like that. So it's also communicating across with other teams. I'm a e-commerce product manager, and it might be common in other e-commerce companies that we have specific teams tackling specific areas like top of the funnel, bottom of the funnel. And uh, you know, the teams that we have had uh, have been doing the same thing for about two years. So my question is at the other end of team formation, which is that when do we think a team is kind of like doing the same thing for too long and we should switch around? I think it, it probably is around the kind of one or two years that you want to do that, but I also think it's it's valuable to think about individuals within the team, right? So some individuals are gonna get more burned out or bored or whatever doing one thing and might get more excited by some shiny new thing. And especially if while you're still growing, that can be really useful because they can come up with a brand new idea that has nothing to do with their team or their focus. And it's like, great, go build a new team around this person and then we'll backfill someone in there. So, cause you always have that natural turnover as well, right? So I think it's not just like have the whole team as a perfect, amazing team and then they do one thing for two years and then they go do something else for two years. Like you're gonna have natural turnover within the team. And then at some point it might, you know, if you have enough original members in that team, it might make sense to go, okay, actually let's switch things up a little bit. Do you guys wanna look after some other part of the product and then have the team switch around? And I think that's what was especially useful in that startup example when we kind of switched people from the BAU to the big feature. If, if nothing else, by building the new big feature, they couldn't leave a bunch of like crap in the code because inevitably next month they were doing the BAU and had to like take care of the thing, right? Um, but also kind of, it's that context switching can sometimes be really helpful to come at the problem with a fresh perspective. One of my questions is regarding the organization because typically an organization will consider this as risky, right? Because that team has expertise, now you're deliberately wanting to switch things around. And I was wondering how to sell that within the organization that there is a value to doing this. Well, hopefully you're doing some documentation and things along the way as well, right? So that that's, that knowledge shouldn't all be sitting in the team because at the end of the day, you're going to have turnover, right? The managers of the team are going to leave or they're going to go do some other job or quit and start a startup or whatever. So you can't just rely on the the individuals and the people in that team to have that knowledge. So I think that that's something you... You know, even if you don't do this, that's something you should be doing to make sure that you have that knowledge within the company as opposed to any individual. Uh, and I think the, the way to sell it is actually about the fresh new ideas, right? So like, we're, we have a declining impact on this metric by the, the you know, bottom of the funnel team. What if we swap things around, brought someone in with a new perspective? Maybe they can come up with bigger, better, and newer ideas that actually give us an outsized performance hit. Thanks. Any more questions? Thank you, uh, Martin. So I just want to double click on the friction kills momentum. Um, sometimes I feel like friction could actually lead to innovation. Um, so I'm just wondering, can you clarify a little bit more around how you mean about how it can kill momentum? 
So I think constraints can lead to innovation and, and new ideas, but I feel like friction between teams is inevitably just a drag, right? It's, a, it's like a, having an anchor behind your boat and trying to go fast. Because, and as we've seen, like, and I think as an industry, we've kind of been obsessed with all of these delivery methodologies, right? And project management methodologies, and how do we deliver faster, deliver faster, deliver faster. Where we kind of, at some point, I, I think in the product uh, role especially, kind of forgot about making sure that we're delivering the right thing. And I think um, a lot of that came from the fact that we were just trying to write software faster. And a lot of that came from how do we get teams to work together? Because it used to be separate teams, right? When I started in product way too many years ago, and I'm sure some of you in this room have done this, right? You're like, you write a product definitions document and you spend six months perfecting this amazing definition that you like exactly the product you want to do. Then you throw it over the wall to engineering. Six months later, you get something completely different out the door and you kind of scratch your head and go, why did that happen? And it's because the teams weren't talking together. So I think that's where you know we found Scrum and Kanban and all these things are much better because they shorten that cycle. They get people talking to each other. But the less, the more, sorry, the more we can kind of reduce that need to go to another team or a dependency on another team, the more that team's going to be able to execute. And I think constraints are still great to like come up with better ideas and it doesn't mean that that team should have all the resources and all the time in the world to like do with the perfect product. But it just means that they don't have to wait for someone else, right? So it's the dependency thing is one of the big pieces for me of like, like I said in that example with the currency team, they didn't have to wait for the banking department to have time to open the bank accounts. They literally had the banker, he could go open the bank accounts. But also that meant that they had the information within the team of how long it would take per country, right? So they could then prioritize. Actually, US is a lower priority because it tends to take us six months to open a bank account or incorporate and open the bank account. And actually, India might be a higher priority because it can do that really quickly. And they had that, all that information in the team as opposed to having to rely on another department. Any more? One more down here? Okay. Um, so within the team that I, I have, where we have four scrum teams, four PMs, a designer, everyone sits together. Like They just literally reach over and can touch the person, which is great. Um, but we're trying to figure out structurally, um, so we have this, each scrum team owns a specific area of the product. And now the product managers own specific projects within the roadmap that we're trying to execute on. But we're trying to decide if it's a better mat matching to have a PM to a project versus a PM to a scrum team. And I don't know if you have any opinions on that. I do think that the PM to project can work and then you rotate the resources. But I think to really get the team like singing and working together, it is more valuable if it is like one continuous team, right? So to the point earlier, obviously, there's going to be natural turnover within that team. But if there's a product manager, then they have their own resource. You know, they don't belong to them. but they have the engineering resources, the design resources, that team's going to gel and really own that customer problem and focus on that and kind of execute on that better than kind of going through a project phase where they have to figure out how do they work together every time. And oh, when you say that, you mean that, not this, like those kind of challenges that come up. So that's my personal opinion, at least, is that that works better. Anyone else? All right. I think that might be it, Dan. Uh, I'll be hanging around for a while if anyone is too afraid to ask questions openly, so thank you very much.